Right, I say welcome to everybody. Thanks very much for joining this uh, update on ovarian cancer, uh, presented with, uh, with, uh, by uh, Eloise Elphinstone from um, the Target Ovarian Cancer. And uh, Eloise, I'll hand over to you and, and let you start off. And after a half an hour or so, we'll then go to Q and A's. So thanks very much. Perfect. Thank you, Richard, and, and thank you for having me today to discuss about ovarian cancer. Um, I'm sort of linked in with ovarian, the Target Ovarian Cancer Charity, and they very kindly asked me to be a, a guest on their most recent um, competition that they have for medical students, um, which I learned masses from, and they've given me some fantastic information, which I'm hoping to sort of share with you today. Um, so a little bit of background about me, um, just trying to move the slide on, sorry. Um, so I'm a GP, I've got a specialist interest in women's health. I'm a salary GP at the moment working in Southwest London. Um, I'm also a menopause specialist. I've just got my advanced menopause certificate and I work at the West Middlesex Hospital and the Chelsea and Westminster team. And I do a private clinic as well. Um, I've also got an interest in postnatal health and I've joined up with the Family Planning Association and we've um, written some education leaflets, mostly on postnatal health, most recently as well on pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, and that's that's me at the bottom. Um, I have an Instagram page as well. So I, I wanted to start today with a couple of myths. And the first one is that ovarian cancer is the silent killer. Um, actually, over the last 40 years, survival rate has doubled with ovarian cancer. So it shouldn't really be seen as a, a killer anymore. And the other thing is it shouldn't really be seen as silent. Um, somebody um, that I was reading about said it, it, it doesn't necessarily shout out at you, um, but there are definitely signs. And there's about a statistic that suggests about 85% of people with ovarian cancer do have one or other symptom. So, so as I say, it shouldn't be seen as either the silent killer, the silent or a killer. And it leads on to my next point that all women with early cancer don't have symptoms. In fact, they do, and it goes back to that statistic, 85% of women, whatever stage they're diagnosed with, so whether that's early stage one, will have one symptom or more. And we need to be looking out for these symptoms. They're often subtle and they often overlap with other conditions as well. So it's not always straightforward, um, but we do need to keep ovarian cancer at the forefront of our minds. As a little bit of background, so in the UK, it's the sixth most common cancer and there's about 7,500 people diagnosed per year. And this works out as about 21 per day. And sadly, 11 die a day of ovarian cancer. It's a condition mostly seen in postmenopausal women. About 10% are under 50, which shows that obviously 90% are over 50. Um, but there are 900 deaths um, under the age of 50. So it is something that we need to be aware of, but it's mostly a postmenopausal condition. And sadly, 70% of um, ovarian cancer is advanced stage at diagnosis. Um, and this is where we need to try and change things. As, as I'll go on to show the next slide, the, the stage of diagnosis very much does determine the outcome. So we need to try and change that statistic and, and be diagnosing many more earlier cancers. And the other thing is, I think in the past it was always thought of as a GP, in a GP practice, you might see one ovarian cancer every five years or so. But actually, in a, a practice of about 10,000, you'll probably see three to four cases a year. So it is something that, that we will come across. So we need to be sort of um, open to and think about. So going on to the survival. So as you can see here, basically stage one disease, the survival rate is really good. So the one year survival rate um, is 98%. And this only drops to 90% at five years. So if we can be picking it up early, there's a really good um, success rate. However, once it's spread, so once it's stage three or four, the, the one year survival rate goes down to 50 to 60% and sadly then reduces down to 27% at five years. At the moment, as I said before, 70% of diagnoses are in these late stages. So we need to try and pick it up much earlier than we are at the moment. 
very briefly, I won't go through this in detail, but just to, to show that there are a, a different groups of um, ovarian cancers. The most common one is epithelial cell, 90%, and these are divided into those five different groups. The most common of those is serous tumours, um, of which about 50% are malignant and about 50% are benign. Endometrioid and clear cell tumours, they're the ones that are more likely linked with endometriosis. So it's not the only cause, but it does increase your risk slightly. And these epithelial cell ones, these are the ones that are most linked with postmenopausal women. The germ cell tumours below the 20% um, ones um, is more, much more um, in younger age group, 20 to 30. Um, and their survival rate of these is much better. Um, and then there's also um, peritoneal, primary peritoneal and fallopian tumours. These are often classed in the ovarian tumour bracket. So, we, um, so those are, need to be thought about as well. So the way I thought I'd structure today is actually using target ovarian cancer's top 10 tips, because I actually thought this was a brilliant um, and simple way of going through ovarian cancer and also just a simple way of just highlighting the main points, um, because th there's obviously a lot there, but we just need to be having the main points in our mind of what to be looking out for. So starting with history, um, there, as I say, most people do have one or, or more symptoms with ovarian cancer. The most common being persistent bloating, pain in the pelvis um, or abdomen, early satiety or urinary urgency or urinary frequency. Um, so the statistics generally show about 70% of people either have bloating or pain. The early satiety and the urinary symptoms are um, around 30% of people have. The difficulty with all of these is they are in so many other conditions. So particularly if one if person's just presenting with one, say bloating, there are so many other differentials that it could be. But the main thing to say is particularly is it's persistent. So for example, with irritable bowel syndrome, bloating that comes and goes or is worse with certain foods in ovarian cancer, it's much more likely to be bloating, um, sorry, to be persistent. Um, there are other slightly less common symptoms, um, but still um, can be linked. And these are things like unexplained weight loss, changes in bowel habit, unexplained fatigue and loss of appetite. Now, again, these are linked with so many other conditions. So one of these is, is not necessarily going to make you jump to the diagnosis of ovarian cancer but they all can be linked. And I think things like changes in bowel habit, I don't think it would necessarily be my first thought of thinking about ovarian cancer, but it is important if you've got any of these symptoms and other things are ruled out that ovarian cancer isn't forgotten about. And actually what's really important is the next point that the, as they are vague, it's not always, you're not always gonna think necessarily straight away of ovarian cancer, but if they are persistent, so if somebody is having them more than 12 times a month, um, if there's more than one of these symptoms that are developing, that's again a sign that we need to be looking into this further, particularly if we're not finding another reason for them. And ovarian and target ovarian cancer have this really useful symptom diary, and you can download it from their website. But actually, what is useful is in these patients where the, the symptoms are not shouting out, they're very, they're subtle and you're not sure, but you're not necessarily willing just to say it's fine, go away and forget about it. This, um, this diary is really useful. You want, you can fill it in, um, fill in the symptoms and look over a couple of periods of weeks or, or months, are these symptoms persisting and are there more developing? So it is a really good way of safety netting. If, if, if you're not necessarily worried, but you don't want to, um, it to be ignored and you want the patient to, to keep an eye on them, giving them one of these and then getting them to come back maybe in a month or two um, with the diary can be really helpful to, to know if you need to be looking into it further. And then the next thing to be thinking about once you've done the history and, and is actually thinking about family history, which, which is quite relevant with ovarian cancer. So the general risk of anybody of ovarian cancer is about 2%. However, if there is one first degree relative who's got ovarian cancer, that risk does go up. So from about one in 52% to about one in 20 and the gene that's uh, most commonly linked to BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, 
they can be passed both through the maternal and the paternal side. So you need to be get, trying, if possible, to get a history from both sides. And I know this is time consuming in a 10 minute appointment, trying to get all of the history plus a good family history and everything else is really difficult. Um, I think that there's a lot of genetic clinics now who um, send out really useful, really thorough questionnaires. So if you've got time and the patient's got time, that is a possibility to be able to use that to, to look into family history more. Um, at the bottom of the screen, I've put the little um, um, Q Genome um, app there. I use this and I use this in my menopause clinics. Um, so it's a really useful app. The aim of the app, I think, is trying to get guidelines from all around the country, all of the different genetics clinics. But I, and I don't think they're there yet, but it doesn't really matter because you can use any of them. Most of the genetics clinics are the same. So there's one of I think the one I use is South East London but they've got all different types of cancers there and you can click on them and then it goes through questions to come out with a risk. So there's one that I use for breast cancer with um, the menopause clinics, but also there's an ovarian cancer one. And it's a pretty quick app to go through to ask the relevant questions just to see if there is a relevant family history. Um, as I mentioned, um, it, it does increase your risk having a family history. 20% of women diagnosed with ovarian cancer do have a family history. The, the most common genes are the BRCA1 and BRCA2. So if you've got BRCA1, you're, so, if, so if you don't have any genes at all, as I say, your risk is 2%. If you have BRCA1, your risk goes up to 30 to 50% of ovarian cancer. And if you've got BRCA2, it goes up to 10 to 25%. So that's why the family history is quite important, actually not just about ovarian cancer, but breast cancer in the family as well. Um, and just as a note, these genes are more common in the Ashkenazi Jews. So again, really important if, if a patient is that, that you get a really good history. Um, and men can pass on this BRCA gene too, as I mentioned. In addition, Lynch syndrome, which is the hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, has got um, similar mutations um, to ovarian cancer um, and actually breast and, and um, cancer as well. So it's important to know if there is a history of that or bowel cancer in the family. Um, and as I say, every genetic clinic is slightly different, but, but this gives a good summary um, of, of who to be referring onwards to a gen genetic clinic, whether they have symptoms or not, actually. So anybody with a first degree relative who's less than 40 should just be referred on. Um, anybody with male breast cancer or bilateral breast cancer. Um, but that's slightly by, the, by if somebody is there with symptoms, obviously you want to be looking into the symptoms as well. Other risk factors. So obviously I mentioned age being postmenopausal. Um, obesity is a risk factor. Ovulatory history is a risk factor. So what this means is somebody who has ovulated more is at higher risk. So somebody who's had early menarche or late menopause um, or who hasn't been pregnant or hasn't been on the contraceptive pill are at higher risk. Um, those infertility, diabetes, endometriosis, as I mentioned, for certain ovarian cancers can increase the risk. HRT very slightly increases the risk and smoking increases the risk. Um, and contrary to that, protective factors, um, so generally people who haven't ovulated so much. So those who've had a late menarche and early menopause, those who've had children or those who've been breastfeeding or on the combined oral con contraceptive pill. Um, and also, interestingly, those who've had tubal ligation as well. And this goes back to a point I mentioned before, quite a lot of symptoms of ovarian cancer overlap with other conditions, in particular irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so it's often misdiagnosed. And a top tip from today is that um, IBS is very rare as a new diagnosis in those over 50. So be really wary of diagnosing somebody with IBS. You've never had it before if they're over 50 and look into other conditions first and rule out other things, one of which being ovarian cancer. And the other thing is um, urinary symptoms. Generally, these people, are, uh, as I say, postmenopausal, they may well be getting urinary symptoms because they're postmenopausal. And it's really easy to put it down to, to genital urinary syndrome of the menopause um, or other um, conditions. But actually, if your people are getting unexplained urinary symptoms before putting it down to anything else, just have a think about ovarian cancer. 
And in particular, somebody who's getting what you think are recurrent urinary tract infections, um, beware if there's recurrent sterile MSUs. So if we're not picking up bacteria, it's not a, a urinary tract infection and we need to be thinking of other causes. So top tips to take away from today, if you take nothing else, beware of new diagnosis of IBS in over 50s and beware of sterile urine recurrently. So for investigation, so obviously you've taken the history, you've got these symptoms, what do you do next? Um, well, probably quite obviously, if there is a suspicious mass there or a suggestion of ascites, these people should be referred straight away to a two week wait. Unfortunately, these are the people where it is often late and hopefully we don't see many of these, but they do need to be referred straight onwards. In other people who haven't had such an obvious sort of um, diagnosis on, on examination, but have got symptoms that make you potentially concerned about ovarian cancer, these are the people that you want to be starting with a blood test for a CA125. So NICE guidelines are just start with a blood test. Interestingly, the sign guidelines in Scotland are start with a CA125 blood test and do an ultrasound at the same time. But if you're following the NICE guidelines, you start with a blood test. And if this comes back raised and raised is over 35, you then organize an urgent ultrasound scan. And if this is positive or shows any worrying signs, you refer them onwards. What I'd probably say is that if the CA125 is extremely high, i.e. above 200, although you might also want to organize an urgent ultrasound scan, these are probably people you want to refer straight away for a two week wait as well. Um, and going on just to the next slide, um, I try to summarize the guidelines in my way of a bit of a flow chart just to make it more simple. Um, but ultimately, as I say, if the uh, CA125 is above 35, you refer for a pelvic ultrasound scan. And if, if it's obviously a suggestive cancer, you refer on. If it's not obviously suggestive of ovarian cancer, you, you would want to probably do the same as if the CA125 is negative. You want to be assessing carefully of are there, is there another cause for these symptoms? If there's not another cause for the symptoms, um, you want to be keeping an eye on them. And that takes me back to the, the, um, the symptom diary or, and, and just to safety net and monitor, it, monitor them. And what is recommended is that you can, if you want, repeat the CA125 after eight weeks if you're concerned. So, for example, if it's raised, but you've had a normal ultrasound scan and you want to monitor, if, if you repeat it after six, uh, after six to eight weeks and it's rising, that is more worrying and you'd probably want to be referring onwards. Again, if, it's, if the CA125 is negative, but you repeat it and it's going up, you again may want to be looking into this further. But what I would say is if, e if either the CA125 is negative or the ultrasound isn't suggestive of ovarian cancer, um, you can still refer onwards if you're worried because there are false negatives and I'll go on to show um, that. And so it's not, these are not 100% these tests. Um, so here, as I say, they can be falsely reassuring. So don't be completely reassured if both or either CA125 or ultrasound are negative and yet the symptoms are um, persisting. So this is where you really do want to be safety netting with these people. So the limitations of CA125, ultimately in advanced stages, it is pretty useful. It is um, elevated in about 80% of ovarian cancers. However, in early stage, so stage one, it's only um, elevated in 50%. Um, and there are false negatives. So it's not raised in all types of ovarian cancers. As I say, early stage, sometimes it's not raised. And again, premenopausal status. So there's no distinguishing um, interpreting a CA125 whether somebody's premenopausal or postmenopausal. Um, but in premenopausal, it can be lower. So that can sometimes falsely reassure. Saying that, you can also get false positives. So um, this is why sometimes you can get a raised CA125 in normal ultrasound scan. Um, so it is raised in some other malignancies. So even if you're not finding ovarian cancer and you've got a raised CA125, you should also be thinking it can be raised in breast, lung or colon cancers. Um, it can be raised in liver disease, um, in endometriosis, and even in somebody who's menstruating, it can be raised. Um, 
it's actually a similar protein to CRP or ESR. So it is raised in these inflammatory conditions. So also pregnancy and, and PID. So in somebody with a raised CA125 who has got a negative or normal ultrasound scan, we need, should be thinking about these other conditions as well. Um, and certainly if it was done when the woman was menstruating to repeat it when she's not. Um, so this, I, I keep going back to this, but safety netting, I think, um, depending on what you're getting from the results and whether you prefer them on if you haven't you really want to be clear about what the, you want the patient to do and when you want them to come back and ultimately they should be coming back really if these symptoms um, any of them are persisting I think we can probably only be reassured if they clear up or if we find another cause for them and a last top tip um, that, that I thought was really interesting is that, interestingly, 31% of women who have a smear test think that that is checking for ovarian cancer. And so they think a normal smear test rules out ovarian cancer. So actually, it's quite a good time to get nurses or, or doctors who do smear tests to clarify it's, it's a, a cervical cancer test, but also maybe to, to think about mentioning about ovarian cancer symptoms and there are brilliant leaflets on the website there's a specific leaflet for um, nurses to give patients just to sort of give more information so people have ovarian cancer in the forefront of our minds um, I don't think it is one that necessarily doctors but all patients always have at the forefront of our minds it's not one of the top ones that people are thinking about so for patients it, it is useful for them to know what the symptoms are so they come to their doctor to, to then look into it further and talking about screening so at present we don't have any screening um and and this is going back to the because ca125 unfortunately um isn't 100 percent or or accurate enough um the most recent study was done back in 2021 it um it's the uk collaborative trial of um, ovarian cancer screening and it was a, a large trial taking 200,000 postmenopausal women looking at them between um 2001 2005 and they were screened and until 2011 and ultimately they were put into three groups no screening an annual ca125 and an ultrasound if necessary or an annual ultrasound scan and what was quite interesting is they did detect more stage one in the, the multimodal group however there was no difference in ovarian cancer deaths or all cause mortality which i thought was interesting because theoretically we're saying we want to be picking people up in stage one to reduce the risk of 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 dying. Um, I suppose probably what it means is that it's CA125 or the ultrasounds are not sensitive enough. It's not picking them up early enough um, potentially to, to, to reduce that. But it, so at the moment, there is no screening. Um, but hopefully watch this space and, and, and there will be something. So I wanted to end with just a couple of safe case studies. I sometimes think it puts it a bit more into perspective if, if there are some um, real people who, who've uh, presented. And I have to say, I've borrowed some of these from um, a gynecologist who did a talk for um, target ovarian cancer um, to give um, a couple of slightly more unusual cases. So the first one is a 70 year old um, lady who presented with bloating and slight pain. And she went to her GP who did an examination and did a blood test. And um, the CA125 came back raised at 256. Now in this case, as I said before, this person potentially could be referred straight on for a two week wait. Um, she's postmenopausal, she's got a very high um, CA125 and she's got symptoms. Um, but it, they were referred um, for an ultrasound scan. And actually, interestingly, the ultrasound came back normal, but the GP still referred onwards because of the high level. And she had a CT scan done at the hospital. And really interestingly, that was normal. Um, and so after a, a lot of sort of toing and froing, she was discharged, but recommended to have a repeat CA125. And if it was rising, to be referred back. And it was. So she had the repeat, it was rising, and she was referred back. She had another CT scan and it was negative. And the gynecologist decided that she didn't know what was going on, but there was something unusual going on. So she, she took the patient for a laparoscopy, consented her and actually um, did a bilateral salpingoophorectomy and um, a hysterectomy. And when the histology came back, it showed cancer in the fallopian tube, which wasn't picked up on an ultrasound scan. 
So I think that the point of adding this is that you can have a normal ultrasound scan, which and there can be something going on. So anything that's worrying, anything that's concerning, refer if they're discharged, refer back again, and um, because it's not always obvious. Um, the second one, is um, slightly different case. So it's a younger lady at 26 who presented with abdominal pain and bloating. She had a slightly raised CA125. So the GP referred for um, an ultrasound and this came back normal. So this is very different to the last case. It's not nearly as high, the CA125, um, and she's young. So this is probably a case where you can be more reassured by a normal ultrasound scan and you might want to be thinking of other differentials. Firstly, did she have the blood test done on her period? If she did, repeat it. Could she have any of these other conditions? Um, and probably you want to be looking into other conditions, looking into other reasons for the abdominal pain and boating, but bringing her back, potentially repeating the blood test um, in six weeks time, if it's not rising or reducing, you looking into other causes, but is it, if it is, then obviously referring onwards. The third one, um, I just thought I'd pop in because I think we get a lot of um, ultrasounds that come back with showing cysts and what do we do about them. So she's a 25 year old. Um, she presented with a, over um, irregular periods. Um, she had no other symptoms. Um, she had some blood tests done looking into the irregular periods and these all came back normal. So an ultrasound was organized um, and it was normal other than a two centimeter simple cyst. Um, so basically, Firstly, it's important to know with cysts, is the person premenopausal or postmenopausal? If they're premenopausal, any simple cyst, um, so that basically means it's thin walled, it's unilocular, um, there's no, nothing else worrying, and if it's less than five centimetres, no further investigation is needed. Um, if they're postmenopausal, I think the cutoff is two centimetres. I mean, the, I don't want to go into too much detail because the ultrasonographers generally are really, really helpful when they do this at putting a note at the bottom of the scan saying, please repeat, or this can this is reassuring, or please refer. But I just thought this was quite useful just to, to know vaguely about what we should be doing with cysts. Um, ultimately, any larger cyst, so in a premenopausal um, lady, any larger cyst than five centimetres, or that's complex, so it's thickened, it's loculated, it's got solid nodules, um, and particularly if they're postmenopausal and you've got a large cyst, you want to refer urgently to the gynaecologists. And then anything with concerning features, so solid, multilocular, multiple cysts, or the patient's symptomatic, those are the ones you refer on for a two week wait. Um, I was going to actually, I was going to put some slides in showing our guidelines, but actually they're really complicated and I think everywhere is slightly different. So I thought this is just a simple way and hopefully you will be guided by the ultrasonographer anyway. And lastly, I just wanted to put in with my menopause background, um, one um, just thinking about menopause and HRT in these women. So we're getting more and more um, younger women who, thankfully, if they're being picked up early and surviving, but they've had a bilateral oophorectomy and a hysterectomy, so they're being put into surgical menopause. Um, and therefore, these women, particularly surgical menopause, often get worse um, menopausal symptoms. Um, and it is a bit of a difficult one to know what to do um, with their history of ovarian cancer. Ultimately, the best thing probably of these women to do is to refer to a menopause clinic. Um, it, most of the time, it is fine to be giving over uh, to be giving HRT to somebody who's had ovarian cancer who has been treated. Occasionally, there are some um, ovarian cancers who who are oest which are oestrogen receptor positive. Um, so that's like in breast cancer. If they're oestrogen receptor positive, you want to be a little bit more careful from an HRT point of view, not to exacerbate um, things. Um, and that's why I suggest just referring onwards because um, you just want to make sure those people are picked out. But actually, the most of the time it is fine. And there are studies coming out saying that people are 
actually getting benefits, survival benefit from being on HRT post having treatment, surgical treatment for menopause. Um, but things that can be done prior to referring, because often there's long waits, is the more of the um, uh, other types of management of HRT, um, sorry, of, of menopause without HRT initially. So that's talking about lifestyle, talking about exercise, reducing alcohol, reducing caffeine, and then thinking about some of the alternatives. So um, there's the Things like paroxetine or some of the other antidepressants um, for mood and hot flushes. There's gabapentin, again, for hot flushes, uh, mood and clonidine. Um, none of these are amazing, but they're certainly options that can be um, can be given. Um, but I, I really would, all my menopausal patients, I've got some who really change their symptoms around purely from a lifestyle point of view. So I definitely, definitely push that and refer onwards. So to summarise, um, we shouldn't see ovarian cancer anymore as a silent killer. We should be aware of the, the vague symptoms that can present, but also not be falsely reassured. Um, particularly with a CA125 and an ultrasound, they're useful, but they're not perfect. So if they're negative, it doesn't mean that there isn't ovarian cancer. And really, really um, safety net. I'll say again, beware of the new diagnosis of IBS over 50, beware of recurrent seral MSUs, um, think about a symptom diary, think about repeating the CA125 and look for a rising trend. And as I say, as yet, sadly, no screening. I think it'd be fantastic if there is, but watch this space, hopefully in times it will change. Um, and just to show, I just, want to show this is just um the website target bearing cancer it is really really useful there are some fantastic training modules um, which i have done myself um for gps um there's also some brilliant leaflets for patients um and the other thing is they've got a, a phone line talk to a nurse so anybody who's got ovarian cancer can ring up but also anybody who's being referred and that can be quite a scary time being referred and waiting to find out they can call up as well and get some advice um so so certainly worth looking into and that is it thanks Eloise that was absolutely fantastic it's really packed um really concise talk thank you so much um I know that we were hoping that we could take a bit of your time for questions afterwards would that be okay yeah of course it was yeah sorry I feel like I slightly whizzed through there's quite a lot to, to put in so um hopefully not too sort of overwhelming Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. So we've had one question from Rita who asked, where can we download that symptom diary that you mentioned? So the website that I just showed um, and actually here on this last page, um, the website there. So go to Target Ovarian Cancer. Um, and then if you I, th I think is there a search box, you could just put symptom diary. The other way is just Googling Target Ovarian Cancer Symptom Diary and it will come up and you can download it and print it off. That's brilliant. And I, I can see or, um, I know in GPs, we, we're now sending lots of text messages as well. So um, you could send the link to patients as well for them. That's great. Thank you. Um, and one thing that I kind of wondered, you mentioned that, that there might be some confusion for patients who've had smear tests. Um, do you, if, if a patient were to ask you sort of the difference between cervical and ovarian cancer, what, how would you describe that to them? I think, I mean, I think, I suppose you'd be wanting to say that that these are basically different organs. So the, the cervix is um, at the bottom of the womb um, and it is a different cancer. So there's cells that are changing and that's what we're looking at in the smear test. We're only looking at cells on the cervix. The, the ovaries uh, are obviously different organs in the pelvis um, and they can't be tested by this smear test because we're just doing cell looking at cells of the cervix and ultimately they are two completely different cancers um, so we should be sort of basically separating them it's all the pelvis is all the women's organs but but they are two different cancers um, somebody has, oh, Richard has also asked, can we phone, um, can GPs use the target ovarian cancer phone line for advice? Or is it Amy? That's patient? a very good question. Um, I, I have to say, I don't know if Amy um, knows, it, I, I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest. I think it's, I wouldn't have, I would have thought absolutely um, and potentially um, worth just calling and asking and asking if there's advice for patients as well. Um, yeah, Amy said GPs are welcome to. So yeah, yeah, 
There you go. I suppose you could use a false voice or something like that, couldn't you? Say that again, sorry. So you could always use a false voice. <laughs> what, pretend to be the patient, you say? Oh, yeah, sort of Monty Python-esque, yeah. yeah. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, then they, it's a nurse helpline, so I'm sure they, they can provide some support or guidance. Yeah. That's super helpful. Um, I wondered whether there were, there were any com common questions that came up from GPs when you present to them and what, when you've offered this kind of advice. Um, so to be fair, with I, this is the first one I've done with targeted ovarian cancer. Um, so um, I think I think the main thing is, and I think probably I'm um, at fault as well, that it ovarian cancer often it's always something I worry about, but it's difficult to know which are the people that you should be looking into and um, how, when can I be reassured or when should I not be falsely reassured and and I think I'm I certainly think since doing this and looking into it more I am adding a CA125 on some more blood tests. But I think what I've got to be careful myself personally is not being reassured necessarily if it's negative just sort of saying that that's that's fine we can rule that out so I, I think I have to say I think I think it is a really difficult one ovarian cancer and although um it, we want to be able to be picking it up earlier it, it is difficult when we don't have the screening tests to, to necessarily help us really um so it, it's not it's not easy but I think I think the things I, I've certainly will take have taken away um it is the fact think the IBS we shouldn't be we shouldn't be sort of blaming other things and really it that should in all cases actually it's often one of the lot it's diagnosis of exclusion I suppose you want to make sure you've ruled out everything else first. Fantastic I haven't had any further questions but of course anybody on the call is really welcome to unmute and just um shout out in case there's anything else that came up while Dr. yeah Eloise can I also ask about HRT? Obviously, um, um, this, this comes up a lot in patients asking about HRT and ovarian risk. Do you know what the, the latest on that, on that is, or do you have a sort of a summary? Or, or the position? Yeah, I mean, so the risks are minimal. Um, so it's about an extra one, about one in a thousand extra risk. Um, so to put that into perspective, so breast cancer risk with HRT um, is about an extra four or so per a thousand. Um, with breast cancer from HRT um, under an underlying risk of 20 as women without any history you've got a 23 out of a thousand risk of breast cancer so you you're increasing it by about four so um with ovarian cancer as I say your risk is about um so I can't work that out per a thousand but it's basically one in 50 um but you're increasing your risk by about one in a thousand mm -hmm. um, so it's, I think with, with HRT, um, what I always say to people is it's, it's a risk, a risk benefit balance. Um, and I think, yes, there is a small increased risk of both of those. Um, and if you do, if you are somebody at higher risk, you probably want to be more aware, but you've also got to remember the benefits of it reduces your risk of heart disease. It reduces your risk um, of osteoporosis. Um, and actually as women, you are more likely to die of, the highest risk factors of death are heart disease, osteoporosis and dementia. And actually HRT is protective against heart disease to a certain extent and osteoporosis. We don't know about the dementia so much. So actually, if you're somebody without risks of the ovarian or breast cancer, actually there are huge benefits there as well from a health as well as a symptom point of view. That's Thanks. So we're just coming up on uh, quarter to uh, two now. So I think unless anybody's got any further questions. There's one more question. There's oh, one yeah. more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is, is that, um, support, I know uh, breast cancer support groups can work really well. Um, is, that, is that the same with ovarian cancer? Are there such groups around that, that people can join, be part of? Is that something the charity hosts? I mean, again, that's probably something Amy needs to answer. Um, yes, and, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah um, um, in the link that I've put there about um, support for your patients, we have an online community okay. that people can join. So it's a really warm and supportive place for people. We also have the nurse-led support line, and that's three clinical nurse specialists run that line. 
um, so they know what they're talking about. Um, but yeah, it's a very supportive community. So if you just click on that link and go to the page, the support for you, for the patients, then that will take you to all of those links. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. And I'll stop asking questions now. <laughs> no, great. Yeah, well, I'm sure that um, Richard and I are not alone in finding that talk really helpful. Um, and yeah, this just feels like a good time to say thank you for your time, Dr. Elphinstone. Um, very happy to be the guinea pigs for that talk. <laughs> <laughs> With the new slides um, but no um no well thank you very much for having me and um i i really enjoyed doing it and learning about your your groups as well so um no thank you lovely yeah and some thanks coming in in the chat very useful and concise talk um, yeah very much appreciated very yeah oh good thank you thanks Brilliant. Well, um, thank, thank you for giving up your lunch thanks, thanks everyone for coming along bye 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 thank you